Good Yantif. Good Yantif. This evening, my sermon is probably going to be a little bit longer than my sermons on Rosh Hashanah. So I feel compelled to share the shortest joke in the world with you. I got new shoes for the high holidays. And do you believe it? One of them isn't right. Okay, no more puns. I just didn't want you to think I was going into a joke. Now, this past August 28th marked the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. Its purpose was to advocate for the civil and economic rights of African Americans. At the march, of course, as we all know, the final speaker was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial, he delivered one of the most famous speeches in history, I have a dream, which was a call to end racism. That speech lifted the hopes, dreams, and souls of so many Americans and of so many people around the world. It's but one example, a very moving example of the power of speech, in this case, to do good and bring light into the world. Tragically, we know that all too often leaders and charismatic figures have used the power of speech to dehumanize others, incite violence, and destroy. Judaism has always understood that language is incredibly powerful. We're introduced to God at the very beginning of the Torah as a God who creates through speech. And just as God has speech, so do we. Just as God can create or destroy through speech, so can we. We can use our speech to build up or to tear down, to inspire or to demean. That's why it says in Proverbs, death and life are in the power of the tongue. This evening I have a request to make of all of us that's very simple. Yet at the same time, this request for some of us or for many of us may be nearly impossible. What's my request? That we use our speech in thoughtful, inclusive, and positive ways with people whom we disagree with. This request could be easy because we engage in thoughtful conversations regularly. However, it becomes infinitely more difficult when the person sitting across from you is someone who disagrees with you on a very important issue, whether it's on Israel or abortion or climate change or immigration or any other important topic. Today, when we know the person across from us holds a view that's contrary to ours, for many of us, our blood begins to boil. A negative voice inside our head says, attack, 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 or demean, 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 or defeat them, defeat them, defeat them. It's no wonder we can't listen with an open heart nor speak with them in a respectful way. With a constant flow of extreme voices on social media and some cable news networks, our country, our society, and the Jewish people are divided today in ways that are to toxic and destructive. And the chasm only seems to grow. And if we can't figure this out and address it, it bodes very badly for our future as Americans and as Jews. I've spoken about this before, and because of the urgency of this issue, I will continue to speak about it. We must try to understand what's happening and find a productive way forward. This strategy of speaking thoughtfully and inclusively with people with whom we disagree is easy to ignore. It may sound too naive, or it may ask us to demonstrate more grace and kindness than we're willing to offer. In addition, some might think that the strategy is too simple and mild for such a big problem. However, I think it's something we all must try for two reasons. First, speaking positively and kindly is within our control. It's something we could actually do if we wanted to do it. And secondly, it's much more powerful than we might think. I want to share with you two stories which illustrate this point. The first is about, is about a celebrated blues pianist named Daryl Davis, who has had a lot of success in his music career, and he's played with some of the greatest rock and blue legends that ever existed, 
Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, and B.B. King, to name a few. However, he has an unusual hobby. For the past 36 years, Davis, who is black, he has been befriending Ku Klux Klan members. How does he do this? Mr. Davis actually goes to Ku Klux Klan meetings. And when they see him and they ask him, what are you doing here? He responds and says, I want to know why you hate me, even though you don't know me. He then invites the Klansmen to join him for a meal. And he says, I want to listen to you explain how you see the world and why you hate me. Most of the Klansmen don't take him up on his offer, but some do. He said, sometimes they talk for hours and hours about their upbringing, about their views on life. And when they finish, he asks them, do you want to hear what I have to say? And most of the time, they say yes, because they appreciate the fact that he listened to them. Davis says, I look for the humanity in everybody. In my worst enemy, I can find some humanity. He continues to say, I'm not so naive to think that everyone will change. But if someone is willing to sit down and talk with you, even if they have opposite views from you, that's a step. And if you spend five minutes with your worst enemy, you will find something in common. And if you, if you spend 10 minutes, you will find even more in common. And if you nurture those commonalities, you're forging a relationship. And that relationship can turn into a friendship. And he says, once you have a friendship, then the trivial things which differentiate you from the other person, they start to slowly matter less and less. Since Davis started talking with white supremacists, he says that more than 200 Klansmen have hung up their robes. When that happens, Davis collects the robes, not all of them, but some of them, and he keeps them in his home as a reminder of the dent that he has made in racism by simply inviting people to have a meal with him. An invitation to a dinner was another important moment in the journey of a white supremacist who eventually denounced hatred, racism, and bigotry. At age 19, Derek Black was considered the leading light of the white nationalist movement. He was hosting his own racist radio show and he had started a white nationalist website that was geared for children. In addition, he was considered to be like royalty in the white nationalist movement. His father, Don Black, had created Stormfront, the, first, the internet's first and largest white nationalist site. His mother, Chloe, had been once married to David Duke, the infamous racist, and David Duke was his godfather. After graduating from high school, he wanted to study medieval European history, so he applied to the new college of Florida, formerly a top-ranked liberal arts school with a strong history program. Once he was on campus, no one knew who he was, and he tried to keep it that way. But during his second semester, it all came crashing down on him when an upperclassman who was doing research on hatred in America posted on a public uh, student website, Derek Black, white supremacist, radio host, and fellow, fellow new college student? How do we as a community respond? At first, the responses were angry and mean. Then Derek tried to avoid people, and most of his fellow students left him alone. In the fall, one of the students had an interesting insight and wrote the following on the student message board. Ostracizing Derek won't accomplish anything. We have a chance to be real activists and actually affect one of the leaders of white supremacy in America. Who's clever enough to think of something we can do to change this guy's mind. Then one of Derek's acquaintances from their freshman year decided he might have an idea. So in late September, he sent Derek a text message. It said, do you have plans this Friday night? Matthew Stevenson had started hosting weekly Shabbat dinners at his campus apartment shortly after enrolling in New College. Although Matthew said all the brachot, all the blessings at the dinner, most of the time the people who came to his Shabbat dinners were Christians, atheists, Hispanics, and black students. Now in the fall of 2011, Matthew invited Derek to join them. 
Matthew made this fateful decision because he had come to believe that his best chance to affect Derek's, Derek's thinking was not to ignore him or to confront him, but simply to include him. Maybe he had never spent any time talking to a Jewish person, he remembered thinking. It was the only social invitation Derek had received since he had been outed as a white nationalist, so he accepted the invitation. He brought a bottle of wine to the dinner. He was polite and quiet. And you know what happened? The next Friday night he showed up again, and the Friday night after that, and again. And after he had been to coming for a whole month, the other people in the Shabbat group started to no longer feel threatened by his presence. By getting to know a group of minorities, including Stevenson, the Shabbat host, Derek started moving further and further away from his white supremacist views. He had always thought that he had based his opinions on fact, but over time he saw that his facts were being dismantled by emails from the Shabbat friends who were sending him scientific papers and other studies which were refuting his racist beliefs. A few months after graduation, Derek typed up a long letter denouncing white nationalism. He wrote an email to someone at the Southern Poverty Law Center, someone, a group that his father had always seen as an adversary for 40 years. He wrote in the email, publish this in full. He attached the letter and he hit send. Why do I share these stories with you this evening? I'm certainly not suggesting that you invite a white nationalist or a Ku Klux Klan member to your Shabbat dinner or have coffee with them for that matter. But if you choose to do so, I say, good luck to you. But that's not why I share these stories. I share them because these st stories are in the extreme. The point they make is even more powerful using words to be kind and inclusive, using words to bring someone in, to invite them to a meal, to offer them human companionship, this is often more effective than we can ever imagine. And what's the alternative? To continue to distance ourselves from people we disagree with and people we've had a falling out with? To stop talking to people who advocate positions which are contrary to our own? To stop talking to people who have hurt our feelings? That's a sure recipe for more divisiveness and hatred. As Daryl Davis says, when two people who disagree are talking, they're not fighting. It's when the talking ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. And I'll add, God forbid. This wisdom is as ancient as the Torah itself. I want to share with you briefly a brilliant teaching by an incredible Bible teacher named Judy Klitzner. She teaches at the Pardes Institute for Jewish Studies in Jerusalem. And one of her techniques is to see different stories in the Bible which have a lot in common. They almost seem to be a reflection of each other. And often she sees that the second story, which is almost like a retelling of the first story, it ends with a bit of redemption, redeeming the earlier story. She calls these stories subversive sequels. She has an incredible book called Subversive Sequels in the Bible. Recently, she asked, why can't we get along with each other? And she said, the answer goes back all the way to the beginning of the Torah. If you may recall, the very first family, Adam and Eve, they had a son, Cain, who killed their other son, Abel. That was Cain's brother. Why did he do this? There seemed to be a lot of tension and animosity between the brothers, but the Torah gives us almost no details. But what the Torah does tell us is that Cain and Abel both made an offering to God. God rejected Cain's offering and accepted Abel's, and it doesn't tell us why. This led Cain to be distraught, and he directed his, ang and his, sh his anger and his shame at his brother. And this, here's how the Torah reports the murder. This is the exact verse. Cain said to his brother Abel, and when they were in the field, Cain set upon his brother Abel, and he killed him. It's a very unusual verse. It calls out for a question. What did Cain say to Abel? And we don't know. Some commentators speculate that they were arguing. But Rashi, the classic commentator, says no. According to Rashi, there was no argument. There was no dialogue. Instead, Cain decided that he would no longer use his words as a tool of communication, but rather only to whip up his brother's emotions 
as a pretext for killing him. One of the lessons of this ancient story is exactly what Daryl Davis said, when the communication breaks down, that's when the real danger begins. And what is the biblical narrative in dialogue with the story of Cain and Abel? For that, we have to go to the end of Genesis, to the story of Joseph and his brothers, which is a story in which brothers almost killed another brother. Mrs. Klitzner asks, is Joseph more like Cain or Abel? And the easy answer is that he's like Abel because he's the victim. Just as Cain thought that Abel was loved more by God than he, and that led him to be angry at his brother. So too, the brothers were angry at Joseph because he was more beloved by their father. But Joseph is also a little bit like Cain. When we first meet Joseph, He's more loved by his father, and the Torah tells us, Yosef et dibatam ra'a el avihem. Joseph is trying to even get more advantage over his brothers. That means he brought evil reports of his brothers to his father. Here we have a little bit of Cain. Cain is not talking with his brother, but at his brother. Joseph is not talking with his brothers, but he's talking about them to gain a greater advantage over them. And what's the brother's reaction? The Torah says they hated him and they decided they could no longer speak to him. Again, speech has been withdrawn. There's no more communication. So each side can demonize the other in their minds and allow that demonization, demonization to grow and it takes on a life of its own. This creates a dangerous, dangerous situation and again, violence follows. Although Joseph isn't killed, he's beat up, he's thrown into a pit and he sold into slavery. Thus we see in both of these stories, which book end the book of Genesis, an absence of dialogue plays a pivotal role in the disintegration among brothers. These stories can and should, should serve as a loud warning to us. As our political and religious gaps are widening, our ability for communication is, is shrinking, and this is a bad combination. And with all this doom and gloom, where is the tikkun? Where is the fix? Where is the redemption in the Joseph story? It comes at the end when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. He's one of the most powerful people in the world. And now he could finally use his power and his speech to torture his brothers and to make them cower in fear. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he uses his speech to speak to his brothers kindly and gently. And he says to them, you can leave the land of Canaan and you should come to Egypt, to Goshen and live near me and I'll take care of you. This is a response to Cain's famous retort to God. Am I my brother's keeper? Joseph here is saying, yes, I am my brother's keeper. I have the resources, I have the ability and my brothers and my family are facing an urgent crisis and I will take care of them. And what's the brother's response? It's incredibly surprising in its simplicity. The Torah says, After Joseph reveals himself and shows his brother's kindness, only then, it says, his brothers could speak to him again. Mrs. Klitzner concludes the teaching saying, In this context, this is precisely the ending we needed to have symmetry in the story. They withdrew their speech because he was abusing his speech. And now they see he's using his speech for reconciliation, so they restore their speech with him. Now we have the first glimmer of hope. With dialogue, connection is possible. Let us use our hearts to guide the words that come out of our mouths instead of, instead of demonizing people who hold different views than us or people who have hurt us. Let's approach them and ask them to tell us about themselves and listen. Let's give them our attention by listening and being kind to them. As John Tarrant, a contemporary psychotherapist and Zen Buddhist teacher writes, attention is the most basic form of love. Through it, we bless and are blessed. May, all, may we all be sealed for a good and happy and healthy year, a year of respectful dialogue, kindness, and God willing, greater unity. Gamar Khatima Tova.